All right, so welcome back into our live stream today. We're gonna to be jumping into Bitcoin, kind of the status around the globe because there's a lot happening in China with bank runs, all sorts of things. We've got the S&P kicking off, earnings coming in this week, CPI numbers printing. There's gonna be a lot to break down and it's gonna be fun. My name is Paul Barron, welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me, of course, to co-pilot on this episode is Mr. Gareth Soloway, of course, from In The Money. Nice to see you, Gareth. Nice to see you too, Paul. Thanks for having me back. Always fun, always fun. And we're gonna dive into a lot of stuff today because I think as we look at the global economic pressures from you know, abroad, many people look at Bitcoin as pretty much, some people look at it as a safe haven, some people look at it as a long-term investment, some people look at it as a store of value. There's a lot of ways you can play this. Maybe you're a trader and you wanna trade it on the short term, but a lot of this comes in from being influenced by the traditional markets. So what influences the traditional markets? We always want to kick off with, of course, the big topic, and that is the S&P 500 falls to a start the week off uh, as Wall Street, of course, is preparing for some earnings seasons to start to kick off. We've got, I think, Wells Fargo coming in this week, JP Morgan, a few others that are really going to start leaning in on, on what the earnings are looking like. First of all, let's get to the S&P 500 what are your thoughts on where the S&P is kind of trending for the rest of July? Do you feel like earnings will have a lot of impact on the S&P 500 over the next few weeks? Yeah, I do think the earnings will have an impact, mainly because we haven't seen a lot of revisions down yet in the earnings expectations. So what's that's, what that's telling me is that there could be a lot of misses in the earnings announcements over the next month or so. And, and that could shock Wall Street. And I think Wall Street was expecting more revisions to the downside. We did see some by names like Target and various other, other players out there, but it certainly hasn't been robust. And you have to think that's a major hurdle the market has to get over. So I, I understand why the markets are a little skittish today. Going into the week when we have bank stocks, we're gonna hear from those, then we're gonna get into technology in the next week. But, but I certainly think that even with bounces, you're still looking at further downside in the S&P as well as the NASDAQ 100. So downside in the short to, I should say near to short term, uh, possibly we'll see some up and downs, you know, which is what we've been seeing here with, with obviously with Bitcoin over whether you were able to get in at the 19 last week write it up to a little over 22. If you look at where the CPI is, this is a good example of this tweet right here, all the charts showing weakness, new lows are just a matter of time. CPI uh, this week, of course, could show some more pain. With that, uh, anticipation of the CPI being up another a couple of points, not full points, tens of points. If that is the case, before we start to see the Fed uh, FOMC meeting toward the end of the month, where we will most likely see a 75 basis points come in. What does it look like right now on the traditional markets between now and the FOMC meeting toward the end of July? Yeah, so so for me, the, the, one, the biggest thing I'm paying attention to right now is the dollar, the DXY. And what we're really seeing is the dollar has just been ripping higher recently, again, sharply higher today. And that's putting pressure on the equity market. So that's the one kind of wild card here where you do have these earnings coming out. Although again, most earnings, the next week or two is gonna be banks mostly, a couple of players like I think Netflix, which is next week reporting. But I think it's important to understand that if that dollar starts to pull back, the market could get some bounces in the mix here. But I'm wor more worried when we get past that, when we get into Apple earnings and, and Amazon and Microsoft, will they start to tell us that things are slowing down? And that could be a catalyst for some major downside in the market. So that would be in kind of second half of, of July, maybe towards late July. All right, so potentially here, some S more S&P 500 pain, which usually bleeds over into the crypto markets, causes a little bit of pain in those markets as well. Always a variation as to you know, how much pain we could see. With that being the case, and at the same time, some people saying, well, you know, hey, listen, this is a good example of this market update, market briefs ahead of the next CPI report that some people are anticipating that inflation is peaking. Now, let's say that July is the peak month uh, and we get one more positive print, another uh, 0.75 basis points coming in on an interest rate hike. With that, if, if this in fact is at our peak, what does this look like over the next few months into the fall months 
if we start to see a downside for both CPI and interest rate corrections uh, in the coming months? Do you feel like we could start to see some relief here, or do you feel like we're still in for a long ride here uh, heading toward recession? I do. So I do think at least the, the inflation is going to be peaking here. And I think it's important to recognize we've seen oil fall. You know, again, it's not that it's down below 100 yet, but it's still off of the recent highs of $124. So I think you see things like that. If you look at the copper chart, copper's had a massive correction. We've seen these big corrections in these commodities that should start to filter in and at least bring the, the, the rapid rises in, in inflation down a little bit. So I think the market's going to like that because that at least tells the Fed, hey, listen, maybe we don't have to continually do 75 basis point hikes. But I think the other side of the coin that, that is kind of the wild card for the second half of the year here is why are those commodities falling? Why is oil falling? Is it because we're going into a recession, in which case that's bad for stocks in that people won't be spending as much money? People won't be buying a new iPhone every year or whatever they're doing, right? And that definitely will have its impact. So I think that, again, there's this fine line right now where the market wants to see the Fed back off from the hikes. And, and again, you mentioned the, the meeting later this month. So I think you're going to get 75 basis points. But the idea here is you want the Fed to throw the market a bone and say, hey, we're going to wait to see how these rate hikes have kind of played out for the next couple months, maybe into the midterms, but then also not not seeing the economy really flush into a recession. So it is a weird next six months. We're going to know a lot by the end of the year. All right. So um, I'm thinking earnings back half of the year. We've got um, what to expect from the big banks this week coming in. You've got JP Morgan coming in, Morgan Stanley, uh, Morgan Stanley uh, Wells Fargo, obviously, and then Citigroup all coming in with their second quarter results this week. Let's let's say and paint a picture here that we, it's not rosy. Okay, so I think they even kind of talk about it here. Analysts expect their earnings to get a boost from the rising interest rates, but overall results will mostly be kind of lackluster compared to a year ago just because of the amount of downturn that we've seen in the market. If that is in fact the case, lackluster reporting on these banks, does that do anything to the market in general at all? Or do you feel like these will come in as a nothing burger and we're waiting more for the innovation stocks to report? Yeah, so so for me, I'm, I'm waiting more for the innovation stocks to report the apples of the world. And, and the main reason here is that if you look at bank stocks, and maybe I can flip over to my chart here, but basically yep. we have we have JP Morgan already with a big, big sell-off, right? So so what this is telling you, the fact that JP Morgan is down, and, and this is the major, this is one of the biggest banks, if not the biggest bank, and it's already down from $173 to $112. So that's telling you that their earnings are going to be kind of eh, which again, the market is already anticipating. Now, I do have a big level that I will throw this out to you. So see this level right here, there's a big gap. If price gets down here, this is actually a buying opportunity. So I'm gonna be okay. watching earnings very closely. If price falls into this support level, I'll be a buyer of JP Morgan at this point. So just something to watch. But for the most part, because the charts have already fell so dramatically to the downside, I'm definitely in the, in the camp where these, these will most likely won't have a big impact on the, the market itself. And all eyes are going to be on CPI numbers, the Federal Reserve, and the tech earnings later this month. Okay, so uh, Gareth, when you're playing out a lot of these historical charts, you look at kind of um, the history of recent recessions, and I think recent all the way back to 2008, yeah. you, see how, you see how some of the adjustments and the corrections also occur. Typically, it's those early movers that are the guys that ended up making all the money um, on these rebounds. Same thing kind of happened with the, you know, the Cerveza dip, uh, where we had that occur in 2020. Uh, again, a bounce and then all-time highs on just about everything you can imagine. And the guys that came in early there were the ones that kind of saw the writing on the wall. With a recession, most likely, and this is a good example, U.S. recession looks likely. There's also kind of three ways the economy could get hit. Um, now, part of this is going to be, yes, we're going to continue to see pressure on prices. We're going to obviously see pressure on high uh, interest rates, slowing of the overall GDP in terms of the global you know, estimate of what we're going to be able to compete with on a global scale. With all that coming into the play, and we've got an actual full-on recession coming at us 
Do you think that, I mean, it feels like this is about as much pain, I think, as the industry can tolerate, even from the, the traditional markets. What are you hearing on the street? Do you feel like people are really trying to brace for something much more worse than what we've seen so far? I do. I do. I think that for the most part, people are kind of still in this haze where, yes, the s and is down over 20, the NASDAQ's down about 30%. But you don't get the sense that people are at that point of throwing up their hands and just saying, oh, my goodness, this is the worst yeah. ever. Right. I mean, again, we are seeing a slowing of the economy, partially, by the way, because the markets are down as people look at their 401ks and they're saying, well, you know, maybe I won't buy that car. Maybe I won't buy that house with interest mm -hmm. rates where they are. Maybe we won't take this next vacation after the one post COVID that we already had planned. So I, I think there's there's this definite sense of a slowing economy. Um, the question is, how deep does it get? And my biggest fear here is that if we do go into a recession and every recession since really, I mean, you could even argue since 2000, but really since 2009, every dip has been met with this massive buying, massive printing of money to get us out of that. With inflation right. where it is, even if it comes down to 5%, can the Fed really do that? I don't think they can. I mean, what are you going to do? Send inflation to 20%, make us Venezuela type thing. So, so it's, it's a really tricky scenario. And I don't, think, I don't think investors have any clue or are preparing for this. Everyone's been lulled into this false sense of security that the Fed will always be there to bail us out. And the question is, when you got inflation where it is, they can't bail us out. And there's right. basically no support underneath the market if it were to start to roll over via the Federal Reserve. So literally, we are flying without a net right now. Yeah. And in a, yeah, in a very, very risky position. All right, you think about that. And, and again, we don't, we're not trying to paint doomsday uh, yeah. here for you guys watching, but you, you as a good investor, you're watching our show, um, you understand Gareth's background. The number one thing you have to be prepared for are some of these kinds of scenarios so you don't get caught. You know? So that's right. the main thing where you're, you know, you're over leveraged which is a big factor that a lot of people have been obviously faced with here recently. But more importantly, you don't get caught in these market moves that could really kind of um, adjust into where the market is trending and that being on a little bit of a downside. With all of that happening, we've got a lot of pressures from a global uh, stage right now, whether you look at what's happening in Ukraine, you look at the Euro, uh, the Euro compared to the US yeah. dollar now. I mean, that in itself, what do you feel like is causing the imbalance right now between what we're seeing in the euro and in the dollar itself. First time it's really been on par with the dollar in quite some time. Yeah, you, ha you have to, first of all, it's, a, it's an absolute amazing move we've seen the, in the US dollar. I mean, you know, looking back, I was just looking at that today and looking back a year ago where the US dollar was, and the US dollar has, the DXY has gained about 15 to 18%, maybe even close to 20% in the last year. I mean, in currency markets, that's almost unheard of, at least in in you know, ad, you know, advanced economies like we have or like Europe has. So I think that's got to be something that investors pay attention to. And you have to look to what's going on with the gas shortages in Europe, how that's affecting, how it's affecting the, the investors over there and, this, and the people living there. And then also the worry about, well, you know, what's going to happen when winter rolls again? We're now midsummer. Winter's not that far away. Will there be gas? How will people heat their homes? Is it going to cause a deeper recession with what is going on there with the supply chain and everything like that? So it is it is a pretty wild scenario. I will say that I do have it penciled in that the dollar is topping here. So, again, I do expect a bounce on the on the euro. Um, if I show my chart here, I want to show you guys this. This is a pretty cool chart. So if I go to my monthly chart, you can see that there are two significant trend lines that the dollar is now hitting on. And again, number one is this trend line here through these highs, and then this little pivot low here right across. And so I do think the dollar short term extremely extended. We've had moves like this in the past, but it been, if you look at the size of this move to this move here, it's virtually the same distance now as this to this. So you also have some sort of measured move going on here with consolidation in the middle. So again, think about this. Think about the likelihood here. The dollar is nearing its kind of zenith in the short term. That should give a bounce in the euro. And that's the one, again, as I mentioned, that's the one saving grace for the tech stocks like the NASDAQ, where we could get a little bit of a near-term bounce going into later this month where earnings start to come out. So again, I'm kind of in this position where I'm saying, okay, maybe over the next week or two, you might get a technology bounce, but then watch out once you get into those Apple and Amazon earnings. Right, yeah. 
Okay. All right. So I'm looking at this from a, a standpoint of the global macro side of things. You look at where the you know the traditional markets are, at least here in the U.S., what's happening with the global monetary systems in comparison. Then you look at the, the overall banking ecosystem, because that's kind of the next shoe to drop is, yeah. do we start to see bank runs, scenarios like that start to occur in different countries? Right here, we see, of course, China. Uh, bank depositors, of course, are facing police now in their protest to essentially deal with what has been a bank run on three major banks in China. With with bank runs happening in China, now granted, does this really affect Bitcoin? I look at it this way in the sense that this is a global effect. So it has the monetary, when you think about how investors think from a global uh, comparison, of course it's going to affect crypto in general, just in the sense that, hey, this is a completely different um, ecosystem in how you know, stored value is, is accrued versus what you see in banks today. With this being the case, noticing this tweet right here, it says, this is huge, don't know how this will end, but Henan Bank is not the only one that is having problems with liquidity. So all four Chinese banks are having the same issue. This is a problem at, in my opinion, could be at a global scale, because if this gets going, if there really is a liquidity issue in China, how does that affect things like the Belt and Road, which affects you know 60 plus countries out there? Obviously, the digital yuan, the remembe, uh, the impact from a global standpoint could be huge. Do you yeah. feel like this has any kind of spillover into any other countries out there in terms of how banks are going to respond to scenarios like what are happen happening in China right now? Yeah, so I, I do, I do. I don't know how much the the public will see it. But I do think that that banks like JP Morgan and Citigroup and, and Goldman Sachs, they're all taking note and they're probably going back to the drawing board and looking and saying, OK, do we need to protect ourselves? How do we kind of plug any yeah. holes and let's keep let's keep a really close eye, you know, keep scanning for any of these breakages in the system. And we know that the repo market, right? I mean, the Federal Reserve has mm -hmm. been having crazy amounts of yep. repo being parked there. I mean, there, there is definitely some issues and this is probably all interconnected. And going back to your comments on Bitcoin is while while things like this may not immediately impact Bitcoin, I do believe that the more instability globally, especially in the banking system, the more it pushes people to accept an alternative a t alternative currency, something like a Bitcoin. I mean, just right. think about all these people that are being affected in, in China and aren't able to get their money out of the banks. You know, think about some of them may not even have heard of Bitcoin before, maybe just passingly had heard of it. And now they're starting to say, listen, how do I avoid this in the future? Let me invest some of my money in Bitcoin. So this is one of those things where short term, I don't think it has a major impact on Bitcoin. We're not seeing Bitcoin rip higher today, but it is, it's just these little pinpricks in the financial system that is the building blocks for Bitcoin. Well, and I think for my point is, is that when you look at something that's happening in a global stage with a country that is on equal footing as a superpower like the United States. Yeah. You look at Russia, I wouldn't necessarily put them in the same uh, level, but you look at China, definitely equal power in terms of what their potential is from a technology standpoint, a global growth standpoint, future standpoint. And then you have this kind of trouble uh, happening within the country of China. That to me gets into the mindset scenario because this this starts this contagion effect. A lot of times it can, and all it takes is someone in Mexico or someone in Canada saying, "Hmm, that's happening in China. I don't know if that could happen here, but I want to create a little bit of a fail safe." I was looking at Guy's uh, tweet right here. Fractional reserve banking is so fragile, so fragile in fact that it, protesters realize how vulnerable they are to a bank run. This is coming from Zero Hedge, uh, again, back on this whole issue of bank runs. Could that happen in the United States? Could things like that happen here? I've seen and been part of a bank run before where a bank has gone insolvent. Uh, you know, the FDIC ended up having to bail out depositors. So it's a scary time. Now, granted, it usually happens in these unknown regional banks. You haven't heard of a major taking on something like that. But this is uh, a little bit striking when you think about the overall uh, situation of what a bank run might look like in other countries. This could happen in Europe or maybe in other, other countries like Europe. So definitely one to watch very, uh, very close.
Uh, this is one that I thought was interesting. Also on Zero Hedge, one bank warns to brace for a huge CPI surge, but then a potential downhill from there. So if we do see a huge CPI surge and then we start to see it fall off at that point, because I think all eyes are on the United States right now with our, our current market, our current inflation, our current metrics overall, what happens to the rest of the globe when they start to see the U.S. start to stabilize? Do you think this is a good, I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen is I don't know if this CPI print will be crazy high and then it'll start to come back in, but it's going to start to come back in just because of the commodity collapse. And also you saw this big jump in wages, but wages aren't continuing to go up at that crazy pace that they were over the past year. Right. So, so there's going to be some stabilization. And I think this is where the Fed is going to initially be able to claim victory. And I, I already see the writing on the wall where, you know, you're going to have all the media saying, hey, look, they did it. You know, the economy's like, you know, still hanging in there. We're not in a full out recession yet. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, the Fed takes credit. And then all of a sudden we fall off that cliff in terms of the economy, right? And and yeah. and I see it just, you know, you could just imagine how when these numbers, these CPI numbers start coming down, it's going to look so great. Market's probably going to love it at first, right? Oh, the Fed doesn't have to hike as much. And maybe, maybe we're going to get a soft landing, a Goldilocks economy. And then you just see the writing on the wall here. I see people struggling already. If you look at defaults in, in auto loans, they're already starting to pop. And again, to me, these are the same signs we saw in 2007 going into 2008. Yeah, the bubbles definitely start uh, coming out of the sky for sure. And I think you're right. You know, used car market's going to start slipping. We're going to start to see some home sales numbers starting to inch down. Even, you know, in markets like Florida, which uh, have been super hot, we've seen slowdowns now, obviously because of the mortgage rates, things of that nature. So it does definitely kind of, uh, going yeah, that's where I, I am. Jump. That's where I'm, I'm in Florida myself. I actually recently bought a house, and and I was able to underbid and get the house for under asking versus you know six eight months ago people were bidding. You well wouldn't even. Above, so. Yeah, you wouldn't even have touched a house. You know, I no. mean, it was mostly going over. So yeah, you're right. It's it is a scenario where I, I think we are starting to see this. If you could put the current economic condition in terms of a lifespan on a one to ten. Do you think we're at a five yet in that ratio or less or maybe a little bit further in? Yeah, in terms of a correction in the housing market, you're saying? or Well, just, just in the economic uh, lifespan. So if it's going to take us two oh. years to get out of this, are we in a five halfway through? Are we in a 60% through? What, what are your, what's your feeling? Right I think now? we're a two. I think we're just Whoa. starting. Okay, we're just I getting into it. And, and listen, let's, let's be clear on this. Is I mean, we are in a new era, at least in recent history, where the Fed is now, you know, the markets don't even believe yet that the Fed won't be able to come rescue us again. They're still in that mm. kind of fantasy land. And so the, the economy is still kind of trudging along. Everything will be okay. You know, and, and just think about this. If the Fed can't rescue us, or let's say they can only do minimal support because of inflation being elevated. And yes, I've been talking about CPI numbers coming down, but let's not kid ourselves. They're not going back to 2% or sub 2%. I mean, they'll probably stabilize at four to 5%. How do you print trillions and trillions of dollars when you already have a four to 5% handle, even with unemployment spiking to let's say 10%. And so you can't, how does the Fed rescue us going forward? They have a dual yeah. mandate, but when both situations, when you have high unemployment and you also have high high inflation or at least 5% inflation, what do you end up doing? Where's the where's the silver bullet coming out of that gun? I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Hey, listen, and, and you I guys want to... Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. and I was just going to say, and, and this is the one caveat here, is that you you basically, I, I often think that the, the Fed has pulled forward an immense amount of upside in the markets for the last 10 plus years due to mm -hmm. stimulus and just printing of money. And it's almost like you have to now have an under trend period where you could see, I, could, I wouldn't be surprised if the stock market doesn't reach new all time highs for like 10 years. I mean, you could be in wow. this kind of lower situation, just like the tech bubble, right? If you look back at the tech bubble, mm -hmm. the NASDAQ right. didn't hit new all time highs till I think what, 2014, 2015 from 2000. Yep. Yeah, so that could be a long run coming, which again, you know, sure, we'll see some, you know, little mini runs and things of that yeah. nature within these. But when you're looking at long horizon investing, that this is one of those things you have to play out in into that for sure. And Make sure and, and I think 
And I think, sorry, Paul, I, I apologize, but I think no, people need in. to just people just need to remember that there's always a bull market somewhere. So, so even if I'm bearish on the overall stock market in the next year or two or many years, there's always areas you just have to find them. You know, there whether it's gold, whether it's cryptocurrency when it finally bottoms out, whether it's the Asian market. I mean, you just don't know. But my goal is is to let people know that there's no reason to despair. You just have to do a little bit more homework to find out yeah. where that bull market is. Yeah, for sure. Listen, if you guys want to see us break down Bitcoin, make sure and hit the like button right now. We're going to get into a chart there. And don't forget, get your questions in over in the side chat. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Let me wrap up here on Bitcoin because that is uh, really, I think, where a lot of people are looking right now. We had a nice little run up to 22. It got a little mushy at 22. Uh, I was in a trade on this one, got a chance to, to do fairly well within it. Uh, but then again, we're seeing a little bit of a slap back here at uh, around 20,500 right now. It doesn't seem like it's holding up. When you look at Bitcoin as it is right now and where the market is going, do you feel like we are going to be kind of slushing around in this 20K run area for a bit? Or do you think there may be some potential opportunities here to either slide deeper or possibly pump up a little bit. I know we talked about it last week, maybe getting to a 25 range. Do you think that's still within within sight? I do, I do. And I'm, that's still where I'm positioned. And if we look at the chart here, you can see that basically the where it stopped was kind of these little pivot points right here and right here. Yep. So it, it makes sense that price was gonna hit some resistance there. I think also, an under a discounted factor of Bitcoin is the US dollar and the US dollar screaming higher certainly doesn't help. Now, how much it hurts, that's up in the air, but it certainly isn't like a, a helpful hand in lifting Bitcoin up. I think if the dollar is topping like I'm thinking in the next couple of weeks and we see the dollar start to come down, that could be the catalyst for a move up and a break above this near term 21, 8, 22 level where we do get that move up to this 20, uh, 25, five level. So you're, you're absolutely right. From last week when we talked, I was looking for potential upside to 25, five. I think we are a little higher than we were last week when we talked, but I think yeah. for the most part, you're just hovering in this wedge pattern. Look for a break here, and then you should get that move up to 25, five. Now I will say, if we break the lower trend line, that would start to be concerning for me. Then you have to start looking for potentially a retest of 17.5 down here. Yeah. But right yeah. now, this little range here, it's getting tighter and tighter. I would say within the next five days, we've got to assume Bitcoin will get squeezed out or one way or the other, either a breakout or a breakdown. My my analysis, my probabilities are still favoring the upside to 25.5. Yeah, I was looking at our chart this weekend and we were charting through the weekend to your point the interesting thing was when we pulled this on uh, over the weekend, we had a sentiment score of 61.89 and an amp of 58.12, which was down from our previous uh, score last week, which had that nice little run up. Uh, but it was still trending down. And even as of today, right now, it's falling just slightly at 61.52 and 58.03. So again, sentiment is the overall sentiment on the market that we register on our power index. Amplification is how we look at it based on how people are talking about it as a future investment, thinking, hey, maybe now's a good time to buy Bitcoin. I'm investing in Bitcoin long term. Those kinds of phrases that we track that really indicate movement there, but we are seeing still some downsides. So I think to your point is whether or not we retest the 17.5. Now, with that being said, you've got things like this happening. I wanted to kind of show you, you've got Bitcoin in accumulation phase, on-chain indicators. So a lot of people still in that place right now. And you mentioned about your strategy right now, because I know you're in, in an active trade with Bitcoin. Explain your strategy of how you're trying to dollar cost average in and what are the triggers that help you make those moves? Yeah, so so I have I have two kinds of trades going. One is a swing trade where I'm just trying to play like the breakout and I'll be looking to take profits at 25.5 and then maybe the next resistance, the rest of it off the table. What you're referring to, Paul, is, is, is where I'm looking to accumulate a longer investment strategy or a longer position. And basically what I'm doing is I'm using the technicals coupled with kind of the fear index, right? So, so I love seeing kind of massive fear and panic in the Bitcoin market. It usually denotes at least a short-term low. And then also looking at the chart, it's about 
where are the technical levels telling us it's going to go? So if we flip over to the chart here, the reason I bought my first one, which was at 19,000, was just simply that it was now we had just pierced the 2017 high right here, which was about 19.5. So I picked up just one sixth of what I wanted to own or what I planned to accumulate. I strongly encourage this tactic because ultimately it saves people a lot of stress. Um, when you go all in at a particular level, it seems right. very painful when it just drops another few thousand dollars or whatever, and you, you might get swung out. One of the keys about investing is to not allow emotion to make the decision. Every decision you make as an investor or a trader should be based on facts, chart facts, whatever it may be, on-chain analysis. But emotion, when you go all in, emotion is going to be a lot higher. So what I do is I, I'm very cognizant of the fact, and I've traded for 20 years, where when my first buy, it's the odds of that being the exact low are very low. So I picked up my first buy at, at 19 and I'll basically yep. buy every two to 3,000 down, which will let me buy all the way down sub 10,000 if it gets there. I don't yeah. know if it will get there, but I always like to add on the side of caution. I would rather own less Bitcoin and have been cautious and protected my capital than own it all and risk being out of the money and, and having to stop myself out. So, so yeah. the idea here is every two to 3,000 down, I'm just going to buy another one sixth position allowing me to have a total of six total positions that I accumulate. And then my goal here is I see Bitcoin longer term at 200, 300, 500, even a million dollars. And, and that's where I plan to hold that position. Yeah, to kind of uh, support your million dollar theory there, the, this was a tweet by Arthur Hayes. Uh, the doom loop has begun. US dollar versus Europe equals one to one. Prepare yourselves for... Uh, yield curve and Bitcoin going up to a million, but please be patient. Things like this take time. So again, back to that point is he's kind of doubling down on his theory. Obviously, Arthur Hayes from uh, experience around uh, BitMEX. Um, let me get into this topic right here. Quant explains how large Bitcoin leverage ratio can actually help turn around the price. How can leverage like this, where we're ever, where we're ever so going up on leverage, help the Bitcoin price. Explain that to me in theory. Oh boy, you're throwing me <laughs> under the bus here. Um, I mean, the only thing I can think of is that is that when you have a deleveraging event like this, and again, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take it from that side, where you have a lot of leverage getting wiped out, it causes a much bigger price spike to the downside, and it ultimately really takes out all the weak investors. And it's almost like that, you know, if you have a wolf pack, you know, the, the weak ones aren't going to be able to stick with it and they're going to ah. fall by the wayside. So, so anyways, I mean, I, that's how I would take it where <laughs> at the end of this flush out, you're going to have the best, the hardcore, the dedicated, and those people aren't going to sell anymore. You've gotten rid of all the other mess and then you can start kind of that strong base of a tree to grow higher again. I don't know if that's it, but that's what I'll go with. Well, and, and I think their argument here is that is that there's confidence in the market for leverage, you know, going in like this and it for it continuously climbing. And then, you, of course, you look and, and kind of compare it to the Bitcoin dominance and where that might play into it, because you'll start to see some more weaknesses in all coins. And this gets back to the scenario when Bitcoin becomes kind of that whether you're a maxi or you're not a maxi or you're a big altcoiner. The point is, is that what we've found is when markets get really, really in shambles, it feels like more, well, on-chain metrics are showing more and more Bitcoin dominance. So hence right. you obviously are gonna see more leverage playing into that if the dominance is, is going up as well. So yeah. I definitely uh, see that coming. When, all right, so let's play, let's play a little bit of a, a trend game here. We're watching for that 25, we could see a retest at 17 if it comes out of that channel. Can you bring that chart up one more time, Gareth? I just want to make yeah. sure I'm right to Absolutely. follow what your, your trade signals are because we're catching this pretty pretty closely. All right, so hovering right now, we're on a couple of red candles right now. What uh, Are you on the hour? What are you on? Are the daily? This is the, the daily chart. Oh, daily, okay. All right, so, here's so you're your on kind the of daily. flag pattern, yep. uh, little wedge pattern. And you're feeling that we've got to be able to stay in this wedge to be able to break above that or get near to that $25,000 mark uh, before. The question is, is whether or not that plays out in the next couple of weeks. What's your anticipation right now if you were trading today to make a trade? What are, what are you thinking? Yeah, so, so 
I would I would be long Bitcoin in here and basically keep your stop just below this trend line. Any sort of okay. daily close below there, I think that gives you a very limited risk trade here. Um, and then the idea is I expect this to curl back up and actually break out and your upside. So so the beauty of it is, right, when you when you're a trader, you want to analyze your risk. So your risk would be from current price at twenty thousand five hundred to maybe a close below here around nineteen five. So you're risking a thousand dollars. If it goes in your direction, you can make as much as about five thousand dollars. So the risk reward there is really nice. Five to one. Um, and again, the key is abiding by the exit should it break, right? That's the key. Yeah. And then, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But the odds right now, the odds are favoring this. And again, I think if you look at the DXY chart here, I mean, this is this is a, an insane move in the dollar. Yeah. It's not sustainable. And if the dollar does get some sort of corrective move here, that would also be a helping hand to Bitcoin. And again, I'd love to say, oh, there's going to be news on Bitcoin. There's going to be this. But honestly, at this point, it's based on usually the stock market, the dollar. There's a few other factors that, that Bitcoin's moving on. And it's really a matter of how people feel about taking on risk. So you need to see the dollar relax a little bit here because honestly, it's spooking the markets. It's spooking all the asset markets, yeah. including the stock market, because of this dramatic rise in the dollar. The market wants calm. The market wants kind of a steady dollar, not a dollar that's ripping up here. Yeah. We're going to do a video on that later in the week about how this could have uh, a very detrimental effect on the overall market, much to what Gareth and I are talking about right there. Dollar versus the euro, the euro kind of matching it for the first time. Those kind of scenarios, then you look at global, you know, unsettling global events, especially what's happening in China with bank runs. You look at what's happening in Europe with inflation and the controllable uh, capability of how the EU can be able to get into a position of kind of holding this. I want to jump to a few questions right now. I know some of you have, have guys have asked me how we do the sentiment and amplification. What we basically do on this, when you go to our chart, this is just on trading view. I score this directly from our power index. So you can go just to our website. You can join in on our power index. It's real simple. We drop three metrics a week. If you get into our mastermind group, that's when we're dropping more daily data in there. So we do drop data points uh, almost every day of the week, including weekends in our mastermind group uh, as well. But it does help you get in and understand kind of where sentiment trends are going. Let's jump into some questions now. If we go into a deep recession, this coming from Tony G., a deep recession. Who's going to be who's going to be buying Bitcoin? What's going to drive the Bitcoin price up at this time? This is my question to you. When everybody's losing their jobs, that's where it's institutional, right? I mean, it's people that are like, listen, we have to invest money, and we're looking for the best opportunity to invest it. Well, and I, and I also think this is going to be the kicker: is that there will be an inflection point. Right now, Bitcoin trades with the overall equity markets. So when the NASDAQ falls, we see Bitcoin fall. But I do think there will be a certain price where that shifts and you'll start to see it become a more safe haven asset, kind of a digital type gold. But I think this is the key is that for that to happen, and this could be what ends up happening. And I was watching a lot of the political chatter and there's there's because investors have taken such a, a, a washout in cryptocurrency, there's being a bigger push for regulation. Sure. And you need to get that regulation in there. So what I could see happening is that you do get some regulation in there and everyone thinks that's bad. I actually think it's very, very good. And then you start to see more adoption when it's very, very low, even in a bear market or in a nasty yeah. kind of recession depression by institutional money. Just like you said, they have to invest somewhere. And if you yeah. get Bitcoin low enough and they start feeling secure about it, they're gonna say, you know what? We got $50 billion or a hundred billion let's throw just $1 billion into Bitcoin. It might only be 1% of their assets, but if you get thousands of big firms like that to do that, that's a lot of money in Bitcoin. Yeah, and, and of course that carries the market up. And if, you are, and if you're a small investor, then you're the one that kind of reaps the benefit for that, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Gareth, how deep will the S&P index go? Uh -huh. um, so I would say at this point, and I'm bringing up an S&P chart and I'll just show it up here. But basically, at this point, I still think we have to this year at least get to about 3,400, 3,390, which is that okay. pre COVID high, right? It's almost yep. like there's a magnet there that's drawing us to that level. <laughs> so you're still talking probably another 10 or 15% downside. My worry is if we slide into a recession, you're going to go to this longer term trend right here, which is around 3,000. Um, yeah, so that would be pretty nasty. I mean, you'd be talking a massive 
S&P correction. But I think this one's locked in and then we just have to see the economic data whether or not this one this one does occur. Now, again, please understand there's going to be bounces along the way. I would just encourage people to understand that, that it's a bear market. So you want to sell into the bounces. I, this yeah. isn't a market where I'm buying in and saying, hey, I'm going to hold this for the next 10 years. It's saying, OK, I'm going to hold this for 10 or 15 percent, then say thank you very much. And I think that's even important to say, you know, I mentioned JP Morgan, where if JPM gets down here, this would be a buy level, but please understand, I'm not saying I'm buying it for the next five years. This would be a swing trade level yep. where I would probably look for a 10% move and then exit the trade. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just just like the just Bitcoin like chart. I was just looking at that. If you went in on last week's raise on AMP, uh, which was up at a point and a half or 0.8, and this was back here on July 5th, and you rode that up to the top and did do that swing, you were up 13.8% in Bitcoin before we started to see the tumble. And again, if you are buy or selling into uh, the bump, then that's essentially it. Sure, you may not catch the top. Maybe you get lucky, you catch a top or you catch it just on the other side. Perfect. That's a good swing trade. So just be aware yeah. of those. Paul and Gareth, love the content. Gareth, you're a financial spirit animal. What would you say is your spirit animal? Are you the Black Panther? Are you the White Tiger? Are you, what are you? <laughs> oh my Lord, I, uh, I gotta think about that one. But, um, but I'd like to think that I'm, I'm, I'm an eagle just soaring up there, seeing as much from a distance as I can, and then just try to make the best decision. Am I going down to grab a snack or is it, is it gonna be a snack or is it gonna be a rock and I'm gonna pick up the rock instead by accident? I must be, I must be an old eagle with bad eyesight. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Uh, this is the first bear market for 99% of the investors here. Uh, that's true. A lot of millennials. And Bitcoin did some things never before. Uh, so, you know, in this kind of scenario, if you're holding Bitcoin long right now, let's say you got in over 40K, obviously that's a hold position. You just have to ride it out. But if you get in under, let's say you were buying Bitcoin under 30K and it's very possible we could see some opportunities uh, to get close to that. Maybe you are a 25K average Bitcoin. I'm, I'm kind of curious, would you sell your bag? If you had a 25K Bitcoin bag right now, Gareth, and we popped to 28, would you sell it all and wait for the dump? I wouldn't sell it all because there's no guarantees, right? Um, I, I've learned that the hard way many, many times. Um, what I would do is is maybe take some off, you know, take a quarter yeah, off. Nothing wrong with taking a little bit of profit. And then the beauty yeah. of that is, is if if it does fall again, you have that freed up capital yeah. to invest at a Jump lower price. In. If it doesn't fall well, then you still ride the other 75% to the upside. So I think it's yeah. money management there. And I think that's probably the best play. I like it. Gareth, what percentage of swing moves do you look for to capture in a trade? Is there something you're looking for? Or is it just based on the asset itself? Yeah, really just based on the asset. I, I generally trade liquid assets. I don't like when, you know, when I, what I always say, people ask me, I used to, by the way, when I was a young trader, I would trade small caps because I always thought it, I could get rich quick that way. And then I learned very quickly that wasn't necessarily the way it works. Um, but basically, I like liquidity because it means one big player can't have an adverse effect on the investment. Um, and, and that gives me more confidence and safety. And basically, I'm just looking at the charts and I'm finding gap fills. I'm finding double bottoms, trend lines, you know, all that kind of stuff just gives me gives me ammunition that's not emotional. It's, it's about keeping your emotions at zero and then just making decisions based on the chart. And that that's really yeah. the way to, to trade profitably if you're ever going to trade trade. I have, I have a theory here with, with trading like that, especially, and I, I kind of uh, look at it from a uh, blue chip standpoint stocks. I usually look at blue chips because they move a lot less. So anything in the two to 5% range, that to me is a good trade. If I get into these more volatile assets, say an altcoin, for instance, I'm usually looking at five to six or 7% range. Uh, and then when I get into the super risky, anything that goes in the five plus you know, I'm kind of in and out on these. So, um, but those are my kind of things where, where I'm betting on it, but it's usually where I'm betting and losing. <laughs> More <laughs> case than not. We've got another poll coming in right here, Gareth, before we get out of here, let's take a look at what we've got. All right, would a bank run on some Chinese banks lead to mass Bitcoin adoption spike? And this was asked of, so a lot of people think, yeah, it's gonna yeah. potential uh, have some effect. And then some people thinking no. And then again, I think the argument here is, it's the unsettling of the monetary system. 
that's that's really what this is about. It's just that little mindset in there going, huh, maybe I should diversify just a little bit, you know, and not have all my savings in uh, in the bank right now. Maybe I want to diversify 10% or 5% or 3%, whatever that might be. It's so uh, important to something. diversify in everything, you know, in, in life in general, it's important to diversify. And that's what I do. I mean, I literally have physical gold just in case I wake up one morning and the banks are closed. You know, just like we're seeing in China, right? I mean, yeah. that would be a perfect example. And it's not like I hold a lot of physical gold. I don't, but at least enough to get me through for a little while if that need, if, I, if I needed to. I like it. You, you and Peter Schiff now talking. You know, Peter actually said he would take Bitcoin to bail out his bank. I think we actually have a story. I saw, on that. Where was I that? saw that. Are you kidding me? This is just unbelievable. Right here. Crypto hater. He around. said he would accept Bitcoin. Is he trolling us? That's what I want to know. Is he trolling us? I think we're being trolled. I think trolled. he's looking to, to do anything to get his bank out of trouble. That's what it is. Hey, man, Bitcoin apparently is apparently um, accepted as monetary means when, when bailing out your bank. I like it. All right, you guys. Oh, hey, listen, Gareth, always fun to have you. Uh, as you guys know, we're going to have Gareth back here on a couple of series. He's going to be back every few weeks. We're going to be breaking down macro and markets in deep. And we love everything about it. So, Gareth, thanks again for stopping in. We appreciate it today. Always a pleasure, Paul. Thanks for having me. You bet, my man. All right. So, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things. This is the place to catch all of this crazy stuff we're doing here on the YouTube channel where Gareth is breaking down all these charts. We're doing alpha and we're dropping it right here in the channel just for you guys. But you've got to jump into YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Make sure and hit the like button on a couple of videos. That way, it'll load up your feed. And best of all, it's going to notify you when we have live streams just like this so we can answer your questions, do some of those kind of things. And last but not least, make sure and get into the Diamond Circle because that is the place where you get a lot of our own alpha here from PBN. It's where we drop a lot of our sentiment data. We do a couple of live streams, additional uh, materials for AMAs, all kinds of stuff right there in the Diamond Circle. And it's easy to do and it's very, uh, you know, all you have to do is just click the link below. It's free. And of course, if you want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.